You know, what is it about liberal media that makes them okay with ripping on a nine-year-old boy who happened to be supporting his team? Well, guess what? The boy's mom and dad jumped back into the fray. Did you know Duke is still a rush-to-court team? And I got no idea whether Indiana has hired a coach or not, but I think they did. We got that a lot more as Do Not At Me, a.k.a. Don't At Me, starts right now. Hey, welcome and good morning. Dan Dockage here, and I thank you for joining us. You know, liberal media clowns can do this. You and I, I guess, were considered conservative media clowns. We can't do this. Liberal media clowns know that they can become complete embarrassments. They can rip a nine-year-old boy and others with absolutely no consequence. In fact, it's not only media clowns, it's liberal politicians, as you're going to see an incredible bumble and stumble by Joe Biden coming up. But I got to tell you, liberal media can just make fun of their own viciousness. They can make fun of their own stupidity. They can make fun of their own ignorance. And they can get away with a case in point. There's a little boy, Holden Armenta. Holden Armenta is a nine-year-old boy who went with a costume headdress. Half his face was painted black. Half his face was painted white or red. And you're probably tired of hearing it, and I kind of am too, but not for your reasons. A lot of times we get tired of hearing about stories. People are telling me, you're obsessed with Jim Harb. I'm not obsessed with nothing. I'm just telling you the most interesting things to me. Well, the most interesting thing about Holden Armenta is not that he came to the game with his face half-painted black, half-painted red, and a headdress. No, it was Karen, who is a man, Jay Phillips, writing an article saying the NBA or the NFL has to get rid of this blatant racism. He was totally stupid. He was totally ignorant. He had no idea what he was talking about. He's a race-baiting clown that somehow, someway is employed. So this kid is a racist. Go to any football game, basketball game, and there'll be somebody there with their face painted with the colors of their team. But the truth of the matter This had nothing to do with race. This was a little boy who's Native American, by the way, supporting his team. Well, here's the deal. So now, well, let's go to this first. So this blows up. Guy in Deadspin, who, Deadspin, this guy is getting exactly what he wants, which is attention, writes this horrific article attacking a nine-year-old boy. And it's totally wrong. That's the biggest part. But Dan Lebetard and his knee pad wearing little sidekick Stugatz, who spends most of his time either, well, you know what he does with the knee pads. You know why he needs the knee pads. It's who he is. He's a little punk, and so is Lebetard. Karen Phillips isn't even worth discussing, but they write this horrible article to the point where a dad has to go on a TV show and defend his nine-year-old boy. A mom has to go on Facebook and defend her nine-year-old boy. It's absolutely disgusting. Here's the dad and little Holden Armenta last night on Jesse Waters. So, Bobo, what was going through your mind the second you found out your son had been targeted like this? Um, it's it's been a lot. It's been a pretty crazy couple of days. Um, I was mad, upset, upset for him. Um, mad that he's upset. He's um. He's pretty devastated. I mean, he's seen the videos and everything posted. He's excited. He's all over. It was his dream to get on the Jumbotron. And I've had family and friends call and, oh, we saw you on on, uh, Sunday Night Football. So he's excited. But then everything else came up, and it's uh, been a little bit of a spiral. Holden, how are you feeling right now? Um, It's okay because a lot of... Kids at school are getting excited, but it's starting to get me a little nervous because if they go a little bit overboard, it's a little scary. Bubba, would you like an apology? What would you like from Karen at Deadspin? You know, I I don't even know what to think about that. It's kind of, it's a little too late for that. Um, The damage is already done. It's, you know, worldwide. Now there's 
comments all over. There's, you know, disrespect towards Native Americans and towards my family. Um, we never in any way, shape, or form meant to disrespect any Native Americans or any tribes. Um, the tribe we're from doesn't even wear that type of headdress. Um, we, it, this specific headdress is, is a, a novelty piece. It's a, it's a costume piece. That's a, exactly what we had purchased it for and, and wore it for not in any disrespect towards any Native Americans at all. And um, it's just, it's been a whirlwind of, of comments coming either, even from, from other tribes, from tribal members. Um, some think it's okay, some think it's not okay. Um, it's a nine-year-old boy supporting his team. That's it, period. It's a nine-year-old boy supporting his team and guys like Karen Phillips, Well, they're idiots, and they're race baiters, and they're disgusting, and they're horrible, and Lebetard is no different. I even hate to give Lebetard any play here, but you know what? He and his little knee pad wearing buddy Stu Gatz, they're just punks. They just are, and it's always somebody else's fault. You know, you can look at Joe Biden, and he's telling you, the buck stops here, I'm the great uniter, and all he does is blame MAGA Republicans, the Trump administration, and with liberals, it's always someone else's fault. So here's what Lebetard had to say. The right picked this up and said, sue Deadspin. Bankrupt Deadspin. Yeah, it's the right's fault. And I can't help but laugh at the center of this. I can't help but laugh at the idea that they want them sued for racism while the kid is still in full racist garb. That's racist garb? I mean, it's all Lebetard has. You think Lebetard can sit there and talk sports? You think Lebetard can sit there and talk about anything but being a fat-ass, non-athletic punk? Of course he can't, because that's all Lebetard is, is a fat-ass, big-mouth, low-rent, non-athletic punk. He's never played anything. He's never coached anything. He's never taught anything. Just a fat-ass, non-athletic punk, all right? The only part of him that's not intentionally kind of racist is the black part. Oh, okay. The rest is team colors, and he's going to, for just being a fan, but racism is already in there. Just not the kind the right is picking up and flogging Deadspin over a five-year-old boy. Like, the stupidity of this is remarkable. Oh, well, maybe it is. But again, it's not. And again... See, they can just laugh this off because they know there's no consequence. There's no consequence for Karen Phillips. I've said this a million times on the show. I had a national uproar because I told some maniac woman (coughs) professor that I wouldn't, quote, go at it in a pool with her because I was a married man and I didn't want to get divorced. That was called rapey. This guy attacks a nine-year-old boy and then... Nothing happens. In fact, he's kind of mocking it, Karen Phillips says. He's a punk. There's no empathy out of these people. These people think they don't even think they're doing right. They know this is the only way they can maintain relevance. They can't maintain relevance sitting on a show like this and talking sports or talking politics and having discussions in depth on both. They can't do that. They're morons. They're idiots. They're inexperienced buffoons. As I said, Dan Lebetard is nothing more than a fat-ass clown who really doesn't deserve our attention, except I feel as a father, which I'm assuming Lebetard is not, never could be, for a variety of reasons, I'm guessing. But anyway, uh, I feel like as a father, somebody has to speak up for a nine-year-old boy. Somebody in the national media has to speak up, and I'm glad Jesse Waters got the family on there. Now, Shannon Armenta slams the article as well. She slams it saying simply this. This has nothing to do with the NFL. CBS showed it multiple times. This is a photo people choose to blast to create the vision. He's Native American. Just stop already. That's exactly right. Just stop already. See, the word racist has no meaning anymore. It has none. I was talking to a friend of mine. I'm like, you know, I used to be nervous being called a racist because you get, I don't care less. I care less because it is watered down. It is diluted. And if you saw the picture, 
Deadspin intentionally showed the only side where the kid had a black paint on his face. So there it is. So they were trying to paint this as the kid wore blackface. That's the level of deadspin. They have another race baiting jackass named Julie DiCarlo, who is the worst woman in sports. She's a piece of shit, truthfully. Awful human being, ridiculous human being, just total, complete human garbage. But you know what? That's what deadspin has become. And they fake up uh, they, they have fake outrage. They don't care about the people that they slam. They don't care if it's a nine-year-old boy, and then they mock him. These are horrible human, peop- uh, human beings, and if you choose to follow them and support them, God bless you. But they are garbage. Uh, speaking of garbage, this segues perfectly. You know, Dana White, whether you like him or dislike him, is a guy that's going to be a straight shooter. When COVID was hitting, Dana White saved the betting world by having UFC bouts on some island somewhere. Well, Dana White, I think, speaks for America. He's a successful businessman. He seems like a proud American. In fact, I would call him a patriot. Dana White had some blunt words for folks in, in, the United States that say, well, I hate this place. If Donald Trump wins, I'm leaving. Yeah? Okay. I say, if Donald Trump wins, he should kick your ass out. By the way, YouTube chat, who do you want to see leave the United States? And you can't say me. All right? You can't. But who would you like to see? So here's what Dana White had to say about folks disrespecting this great nation and about folks threatening to leave. Here's Dana White. If you look at all the going on in the world right now, if we went to war, there's no respect for the police anymore. There's no respect for the military, our country, our way of life that we have here. You can sit around and you can pick, you know, nitpick and, and talk about things that are wrong with the United States. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell your generation, my generation, everybody's generation. This is it. So all these they're like, oh, God, if President Trump wins, I'm the country. They all say it. Nobody does it. It's exactly right. They all say it. The funniest thing of the, of the time in 16 when Trump won was that smug-ass George Clooney. Well, Trump's not going to win. No, he, he's just not going to win. He, he's not going to win. Uh, no, he, he's just not going to win. Really? Okay. I mean, it's amazing to me how smug, arrogant, and stupid these people are. Look, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Trump wins, you want to leave? Get the hell out. Nobody's going to miss you. You can make music from the UK. You can do whatever you'd like. But the fact of the matter is, I'd like to see every human being in Hollywood. I'd like to see Mark Ruffinello or Ruffalano or whatever the hell his name is. Get your ass out of here. If you've appeared on ESPN, over the last year, and your name's not Seth Greenberg, or your name's not Fran Frischella, get the hell out of the country. Just go. Kim Mulkey, get your ass out. Angel Reach, we'll see you. Just get them all out. Yeah, just get them the hell out. Everybody that is so self-important that we got to listen to them, get out. Every diva wide receiver, get your ass out. Deontay Johnson, get out. I'm giving you my list. Yeah, it's a good list. Every time I see Jalen Rose, which I'm glad we don't have to see him anymore, get out. Just get out. Dylan Mulvaney, get your ass out. Adios. See, I would start by if I were Donald Trump and if I win, I would start a caravan of get your ass out. G, get your, or yo, Y G Y A O, get your ass out. Who else would you put in there? Every anchor on CNN, get your ass out, gone, out. L Duncan, if you even know who L Duncan is, get G Y A O, just go. You don't like it here. You want to make stuff up. You want to be a liar. Levitard, adios. Karen Phillips, hasta la vista, Julie DiCarlo, whoever the hell you are, get your ass out. See, that's how I look at it. Like, if you're going to be, there should be restrictions on who we allow to live here in the United States. I'm on to something here. If you come on a media, whatever, platform, 
whether it is TV, streaming, radio, Twitter, and you're a blatant and proven liar. You got to go. You just got to go. If you spew hate like Karen Phillips, Dan Lebatar, and knee pad wearing Stugatz, you got to go. If you are a guy that puts hate on your airwaves, you got to go. If you lie about don't say gay and other type, you got to go. If you're involved in a fight in a mall, you got to go. No, seriously. If you're one of them big fatties that fights in a mall, you got to go. If you're arrested in a Walmart for a disturbance, you got to go. If you walk into a CVS and you steal stuff and you're caught, you just got to go. Just deport you. You don't want to follow the rules? Then you just have got to go. It's that simple. That's how we get this country back. Yeah? And let me tell you something. We're not going to deport you to England or Paris or Rome or Monte Carlo. We're going to port your ass. We're going to port deport your ass over the border, across the river, in El Paso. That's right. Get down there in Mexico and figure it out. Go see the donkey and the bride show. And then let me know how that works out for you. That's what I would do. I would have a G-Y-A-O program. And it would be so good that you would have to live to a certain standard. See, in China... They're starting to put little monitors on you. They're starting to make you have a score, like a life score. That's what I would do here, but I wouldn't even have the score. I'd be like, look, you're too stupid. You got got in a fight in a mall. You got to go. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. At the CVS by my house, I went to go buy, I think I bought Harry's razors. So I went in there, and they were in a case. I go, what's the deal? He goes, yeah, idiots come in. And it's a high-end art item, so we have to lock them up. I'm like, razors, really? Yeah. I mean, look, if you're caught looting, you're going to what? You're good. You're going to Valdez, Mexico, or whatever that place is. I forget it. I was there one time. Not Valdez. What the hell is it called? I don't know. It's right across the border. Get the hell out. You commit murder. You're going to jail for life. I could have this whole country straightened out in like 10 minutes. And if you try to come back into the country, then we're going to throw you in jail. But you're not allowed to just go loot places. You're not allowed to murder, rob, carjack. You're going to jail. But more than that, if you act like an idiot and you start yelling and screaming about how you're going to leave the country, just get out. Man, Dockage, you know, that's communism. That's, now so what? So what? Sue me. That's what I'm doing. G-T-F-O. That's right. I'll let you figure out what that means. Are African-American people starting to wake up? Are they? I mean, look, African-American people, are you starting to wake up? Are you actually going to start thinking about voting, uh, who you're voting for, before you just vote straight line Democrat? Is that going to happen? I mean, the NBA plays African-American folks like a bass fiddle. The NFL plays African-American folks like a bass fiddle. They do. Go vote, the rich African-American NBA player says. We're so concerned that we're not going to have games on Election Day, the rich, white, woke Adam Silver says. Well, guess what? I think African-Americans are starting to wake up. I do. We talked about it last week. 8% were for Trump back in 16, 22% apparently are now. Oh my God, are you actually starting to say, wait a second, these Democrats have kept us poor for years? Are you actually starting to wake up? Oh, you pesta, my eyes are burning. And if you think that's racist, tough shit. It's not. It's just simply what I'm seeing happening because make no mistake, in major cities for years and years and years and years and years, You know, a Republican hasn't been the mayor of Chicago since 1931. And yesterday, the mayor of Chicago blamed Chicago uh, problems, murders, carjacking, unemployment, poverty, on Republicans, on the right. That's how stupid these people are. But anyway, a Black Lives Matter leader, wow, threw his support behind Donald Trump. Really? You're starting to wake up, huh? 
accusing Democrats of racist policies that are working against the black community. Charles Barkley famously said it best. You know what? Black people keep voting for Democrats and black people keep being poor. Exact quote. I don't know. Mark Fisher is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter in Rhode Island. He said it's the duplicity of the Democrats is what this man said. He did. All right. We have, we have the audio, I believe. Do we have the audio? I think personally it's the duplicity of the Democrats, <clears throat> the hypocrisy. Um, we're not stupid. The brothers are not stupid. We, we understand when someone's for us and when someone is not. And it's obvious that the Democratic Party is not for us. Their policies actually strike at the heart of the black family. A lot of people are misinformed. They don't really understand because they don't educate themselves on, on Donald Trump as a person and his history. Um, but if they do that, and it's going to take, you know, leaders, educated leaders, getting the word out there. Um, I think that it, it'll happen on its own. It, it'll be organic because um, personally, I love the man. I mean, how could you not like if, if a real man? Uh, how could you not relate to someone like that? Really? They're starting to wake up, huh? You're starting to pay attention. Donald Trump was never considered a racist until when? Well, when he ran for president. He was always the go-to guy for civil rights leaders, Jesse Jackson, Sharpton, you name it. African Americans were embraced by Trump. Now, yes, I know in like 1984 he had a housing problem. All right, get over it. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. But the truth of the matter is, African Americans, I don't know what to tell you, man. You can keep blindly following and hope that the Democrats keep buying you off with social programs if that's what you think is great for uh, African Americans. I personally don't think it's worked very well. I mean, I've said this before and I'll say this again, and I know it's racist. 13% of the population, African American, commits 51% of the murders. Probably could break that down less. 6% of the population, African American men's probably commit most of that 51%. It hasn't worked. It just has, hasn't. And you can blame the right all you want in Chicago, but again, African American, or excuse me, Republican mayor hasn't been there since 1931. I want you to think about that. So the truth of the matter is, if you're going to vote for this guy, we're going to show you what you're voting for. This is Biden yesterday. And you think it's going to get better? It's going to get worse. This is Biden yesterday. Now look, my, my Marine carries that in has a code to blow up the world. Uh, no. That doesn't, this is not nuclear weapons, oh, is no. it? All right, okay. <laughs> I am friends with your leader, Mr. Moon, you know, you know we're, we're, we're good guys. We could use it to strengthen the Social Security and Medicare system instead of cutting them, or like Congressman Trump and Bob were. That's what we got. That's what we got. Do we have, do we have, uh, I don't think we have audio of Trump, do we, from yesterday or video as a comparison? I'm, okay, I must have screwed that up. I thought that we did, but I got to tell you, that's what, hey, can we play that again? I don't think people, you think this is getting better? Like, do you think this is, as he gets older, that this right here that you're going to see again is getting better. Do you think that? I don't know, man. That would be a modern day miracle. I know he's a most powerful imbecile in the free world, but do you think what this guy's going to say right here is going to get better by the time the next election comes around? Let's hear again from Jolton Joe Sniffin' Joe. Now look, my, my Marine carries that. It has a code to blow up the world. That doesn't, this is not Nuclear weapons, oh, is it? No. All right, okay. No. I am friends with your leader, Mr. Moon. You know, home. You know, we're, we're, we're good guys. We could use it to strengthen the Social Security and Medicare system instead of cutting them, or like Congressman Trump and Bob. Greg, Kevin, Congressman Trump, what are we doing? Like, you're going to vote for that. And the problem you have is the person that would replace him, were there a death or any kind of incapacitation is dumber than him. I don't get it. Hey, look, I understand. I hate uh, Trump. I hate this. I hate that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to vote for that. You're voting ignorant. And I'm glad to see African-Americans are waking the hell up. 
Back to sports, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Did you know this? So now, Kim Mulkey tells reporters what the hell they're supposed to do. Bob Knight always used to tell reporters what they're supposed to do. Mike Krzyzewski used to tell reporters what they're supposed to do. Apparently, these men and women are, well, leaders. They tell us. They demand. They're awesome. Jason Kidd's the next in line. Jason Kidd, apparently, he calls out ESPN reporter Tick Tim McMahon, McMahon, I don't know how to say his name, during a post-game press conference. Kidd was mad and says that he should write some positives for a change. After the reporter tried asking Jason Kidd what caused Luca and Kyrie to take steps in the right direction this year. Let's hear from Jason Kidd. But you're not making a big deal about it this year because it's going good, right? So write some positive I just asked you a question. And I'm giving you an answer. <laughs> like, I'm t- you guys, you know, there's all right to write positive stuff. People will read your positive <laughs> You don't always have to be negative. Right? Like, it's, it's just the world's already negative enough, right? So let's see some positive stuff on some positive people that are playing, doing their job on a nightly basis. Yeah, hey, uh, Jason, stick it. I mean, just stick it. I mean, look, I get it. You won a championship. I get it. We're all supposed to genuflect. I don't even think he won a championship. Never mind. Uh, I get it, right? I get it. You're defending your players. You're a former player. Blah, 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 blah. But the fact of the matter is, why don't you give them some positive stuff to write? I mean, look, Luca's averaging, listen to this, 31, 8, and 8. He's leading the team in everything except for blocks. Uh, 24 and a half is what Irving's averaging. So they are playing pretty good. Team's 11 and 6, which is like a record for these guys. So, yeah, he's probably right. You probably could write some positive stuff. But I don't think the question about, hey, these guys are headed in the right direction seemed like a negative thing. Now, look, if you write for ESPN, the fact of the matter is, particularly if you're a beat writer, you really don't get that negative. Like, for Jason Kidd to lose his mind over something like that or some negative write from ESPN, I don't think so. ESPN went out at least in my world of the Colts, and hired the most milk toast writer, the mil- most milk toast human being there is, Stephen Holder. He's a fake guy, but they hired him because, well, he's African American. That's number one. Actually, probably the only reason. Number two, he don't cause any controversy. He don't know enough to cause any controversy. Except if you criticize him, he's going to call you. Ra- he's going to call you racist because, well, like Karen J. Phillips, it's all he's got. But the fact of the matter is, ESPN doesn't hire and employ hard-hitting journalists to cover the team. Now, that's a fact, Jack. Now, if the Dallas Morning News has you pissed off, I can understand that because that's where you eat. You eat right there in Dallas. But the fact of the matter is, Jason Kidd getting his, and I don't think I've ever used this before, panties in a bunch doesn't make <clears throat> excuse me a whole lot of sense over that particular question. Now, I'm not saying that particular question is good, bad, happy, or sad. But I am saying, shut up, Jason Kidd. And Jason Kidd needs to start talking like a coach. He's talking too soft. Why don't you write some positive stuff? No, stop it. Talk like a man. Get some gravel in your voice. Get some, oh, man, I've been yelling. I've been yelling for, I don't know, 10 days. You ever hear some of the great coaches talk at this time of year? Hell, Mike Tomlin. He got at least, you know, well, you were going to do this. We're gonna... Talk like Tomlin. Talk like Tom Allen, the recently fired coach at Indiana. I, I, we're gonna, we're gonna, I mean, you can't talk. See, I talk every day for only two hours. My voice is good for about two hours, but days like today sometimes, it gets a little gravelly. Eh, what are you going to do? It's the way of the world. But Jason Kidd, I'd listen to you if you had a little toughness in your voice. Don't be cute. Be tough. That's my new motto. <clears throat> I got all this to be cute. Don't be cute. Be tough.
Hey, send me your get the hell out of here uh, recommendations coming up. All right, I want to get into this. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is back. I'm going to read this correctly. Uh, he is back doing functional football activity. I'm going to say that again. Functional football activity. Now, those of you that are old, like me, think, well, functional football, he's going to get hit. Wow, we got pads on. We're gonna ta- hey, we're going to take this to the shed. We're going to knock the living soap out of people. Ah, harumph, harumph, harumph. No, 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 no. Modern football means functional football activity is this. It's, eh, we're going to get out there and throw the ball a little bit. Eh, we're going to get out there and, eh, shorts, shirt, maybe a hat, some tube socks. You know, I was trying to explain to somebody yesterday. I went to Dick's to go get a bunch of helmets for our bikes giveaway that we're doing. And I was in Dick's. I saw some socks. A couple of the employees came up and said, hey, Dan, how you doing? They want to take pictures. So we took pictures. I go, you guys know what tube socks are? Anybody know what tube socks are? Because every sock now has a heel. But anyway, so uh, Rogers comes out there with some tube socks, a shirt, some tight shorts, and he slings the football a little bit. That's what functional football is right now. It's not getting hit. And Robert Sala said as much. Robert Sala tells reporters the team is opening quarterback, listen to this, Aaron Rodgers' 21-day practice window. Basically, you got 21 days to make a decision. The word on the street is Rodgers would want to come back. I want to make sure I got this right. He wants to come back week 16, which is Christmas Eve, which would be kind of cool. But riddle me this, Cato. I look at the Jets, and I see awful. I look at the Jets, and I say to myself, look, by week 16, Jets are going to be done. By week 16, I'm guessing everybody packs it in. However, Aaron Rodgers would provide life. But in the big scheme of things, do you really want, do you really want Aaron Rodgers out there? You're four and seven right now. Do you really want, let's just say for the sake of argument, week 16, I'll give you a couple more wins. You're six and nine, okay? Do you really want to bring Aaron Rodgers out there? Do you really want to see? It is something. It would be a modern miracle. It is 11 weeks post-surgery on an Achilles. It is pretty good, and it makes me want to go get in the room, buy some hemp, maybe get a hemp bracelet and chew on it all day, or go in the dark for 24 hours. I don't know. Whatever he's doing seems to be working. But do you really want to risk Aaron Rodgers on the field week 16 with arguably the worst NFL team currently? Look, the worst NFL team is the New England Patriots. They're horrible. They're awful. They're gabosh. But I tell you this, the worst team to watch offensively? Oh, man, it ain't even close. It really is not even close. It is the J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. And I don't think Aaron Rodgers is going to change that. I I really, really don't. You know, I sent, I was part of sending. I was the financial part of sending a young lady to Harvard. The lovely Tegan Shaw, my stepdaughter. Love that girl. She went to Harvard. And I've told you this before. Harvard, my Harvard experience... Uh, Among the girls of the Harvard softball team, uh, it was my Harvard journey. It was my Harvard journey. That's what we called it. That's right. I would tell the girls, eh, my Harvard journey is awesome. My Harvard journey has been fantastic. I didn't have to deal with anti-Semitism or anti-Serbianism or anti-Polishism on campus. I walked around. I never peed on John Harvard's shoes. And by the way, 
Don't ever touch the shoes on that statue because that's one of the things you're supposed to do. That and jump off the bridge into the Charles River and run around naked uh, in one of their things with the band playing. You're supposed to do that. All right. So there's a Taylor Swift course being taught at Harvard. They're going to use, Harvard's going to use music to explore race, class, and American whiteness. That's right. Stephanie Burt, a Swift mastermind who's described by the student newspaper as a diehard Swifty. We are lucky enough to be living in a time when one of our major artists is also one of the most famous people on the planet. Why not have a course on that? All right. There you go. The syllabus states students will learn how to think about white text, southern text, transatlantic text, and queer subtests. It's time to teach some lessons. That's what Taylor Swift wrote in a 2002, uh, 2022 song. Students at Harvard will not, ladies and gentlemen, just analyze Swift. They will get themselves involved in T Travis, Kelsey, and Taylor Swift. Required reading span from Willa Cather's portrait of the female artist in the Song of the Lark and James Weldon Johnson's The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, a novel dissecting issues of race and class in the post-Reconstruction South. I got to tell you, the class will also, students will earn college credit for their deep dives into Swift's lyrics, music, influence, dissecting her catalog, reading a host of authors. There you go. I would be very, very, very bad student. I would sit there and look at this woman and go, shut the up. I would be a bad student in college. I don't know how you guys would be. I think most of the people that are on my YouTube page would be bad current students in college, having to listen to a bunch of woke, have never done nothing intellectuals, sexual intellectuals, we used to call them, AKA effing know-it-all. See the sexual to effing intellectuals to know-it-all. Sexual intellectual equals know-it-all. See what I did there? It's clever. Yeah, you'll figure it out in a little bit. Anyway, good for Harvard wasting parents' money Good for kids taking a class where they can learn, I'm guessing again, American Whitey is bad. Let me just state this. American Whitey is awesome. Ain't nothing wrong with the American white guy or white woman. We should celebrate the American white woman. We should. You know what? All things being equal, uh, what's her face? Trump's wife, Melania Trump, should be on the cover of every fashion magazine but we can't have it because she's too white. Celebrate, people. <laughs> Celebrate, I guess. I don't know. I'm sure that's considered racist. But I'm just tired of schools saying, hey, we got to get a deep dive into American racism of whiteness. Shut up. We'll be right back. We know how we view Harbaugh right now. I think the general consensus uh, is he absolutely well, knew what was going on? Everyone other than Michigan people, how they view. Yeah, that. or but there are, there are still like former players that didn't play at Michigan. They're just like this is way overblown, right? But they would also lean towards the idea that he definitely knew what was going on. But props to like for instance UCLA and how they handled last week. And I I sat here and said on Friday of last week, and, and Davey saw saw through this. I was like UCLA knows the players know that the report's out there and there's no backing or, 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 or denying this report that Chip Kelly's out if he loses. If he wins, well, he could be out at the end of the season. I don't know mentally how that I would react to that if I'm a UCLA football player, for instance. But they, they handled it perfectly and boat raced a team that has thrown in the towel and they, they waved the white flag. Michigan's players have not done that. And... I, in a weird way, Chad, I respect the hell out of that about how they've treated this. Using it as motivation. I, I get it. Sometimes you have to manufacture your own motivation. But it's not like Michigan is Georgia. So if Michigan goes on a run to win the national championship, hypothetically, it's not going to be the three-peat. It's going to go down in history as what? 
because we're going to view Harbaugh, I think, in a different light than the players, but it's going to be effective. J.J. McCarthy's not being mentioned for a Heisman campaign, and I guess he wouldn't because they hand off 36 times in the second half against Penn State, but he can, he can let it rip. He was mentioned in the Heisman discussion midway through the season, not because he's handing off to running backs all the time. Point being, I respect the players, but I don't respect the program right now. You know, back in the day, like, I'm older uh, than Ty Detmer, but I remember 1990, it was like, what did I care about BYU football? I was coaching at Indiana basketball with Coach Knight. We were in Hawaii, and all we were doing it for the Maui Classic was following Ty Detmer and how many yards he would get per game. Coach and I, Coach Knight and I would be like, Man, this is amazing stuff going on. Now everybody throws for a billion yards, but you know what? Ty Detmer in 90 threw for more than anybody. It was just fun to watch. He won the Heisman Trophy. He's nice enough to join us now. So I'm seeing in the world of college football, Ty, that a good quarterback, according to the Nebraska football coach, Matt Rule, goes for, I don't know, a million to a million five. Some guys, it's reported, making up to five, six million. What would you have been worth? What would your worth have been back then? You know, probably not a lot because I don't think I would have left BYU or even looked at leaving uh, Coach Edwards there and, and leave the team hanging. So it, it probably wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have had very many offers. But um, it's crazy. I, I was reading that to my wife last night. And she's like, "Man, this is wild." So a little different. <laughs> could, could you imagine? Like, you're a Heisman Trophy winner. Could you imagine? And this, this is, I coached for a thousand years at Indiana, Bowling Green, whatever, and I couldn't imagine a player coming into my office and saying, yo, coach, you know, I averaged about 18 last year. Uh, here's my agent. You guys negotiate a raise for me. Could you imagine doing that with Coach Edwards? No, that, that would have been tough to do. I mean, it, it's definitely enticing because I knew I wasn't going to be a high – draft pick so you know the the future was really uncertain so you know if you can make some while you can it is enticing to look at it but i i couldn't imagine going in and telling coach edwards you know here's the price take it or leave it you know that i, I don't right. know i grew up coach the son and just probably a little different than than most yeah, I mean, when I walked into Coach Knight's office, I was crapping my pants hoping that I could keep my scholarship, man. I wasn't going to I wasn't gonna ask. But you know what? It, it, it's, are, are you um, – where are you with this? Like, it, it, you know, you have a unique perspective. You're coaching high school. You play, obviously, in the NFL. You've done all these things, coached in college. Where are you with things like a quarterback making 1.5, players making this kind of money in college? Well, I, I definitely think it's, it's good for the players to have some re revenue sharing with the schools and things because, you know, I look back and, you know, the school, they use me for a lot of different things and I didn't I didn't get much from it, uh, nothing um, from the school other than the scholarship and an education, which, you know, meant a lot at the time. So um, I, I definitely think there's got to be something, but I, I also think there's going to be a cap at some point and, you know, schools are going to branch off, maybe form their own league, make it like an NFL type of model, have regions across the country and, and uh, try to have some type of salary cap to, to kind of calm the storm here a little bit. But uh, something's got to give here in the next couple of years, I believe. Yeah, it really does. It feels like something does. Uh, let me go on the field. Uh, when you played, there was no college football playoff. Now it's at four. It's, it, it's incredibly popular. Where are you at with it? Two things. Um, how many teams do you think is right? And do you think this current format of, you know, a committee and all that is the right way to go about it? You know, I, I do. I think there's got to be some type of human element. I mean, here in Arizona, we have a, a what they call the open for high school playoffs, and they take the top eight teams based on a computer ranking, supposedly. Um, but uh you know, if there was a human element, I think it, it helps a little bit with that. But, you know, I, I think eight teams is a great place. That that way, somebody's always going to feel like they're left out. But at least you include the top five or six that, 
that, uh, you know, a team's left out every year that you feel like should have an opportunity to play in it. So eight's probably a better number than four. And that way you don't, you don't leave out somebody that, that really uh, probably should be in there. I tell people, look, I'm old, I'm fat, and I need entertainment on TV, so I'll take more. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you get to my yeah. age, 61 years old, and you're like, hey, I just want to look forward to something to watch tonight, right? Um, yeah. I assume as I'm a Heisman, I assume as a Heisman, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I said they at least have four now. I mean, before it was just, you know, you never knew what was going to happen, but at least they're playing for it now, and. But I think if they could expand to eight, it would make it a little bit more inclusive for, for a couple other teams. I agree. I think this year in particular, there's a lot of teams that are pretty damn good and seem to be pretty even. You're, I assume you're a Heisman voter. How important are this weekend's games for the guys that are supposedly the lead candidates? You know, I, I'm kind of two schools of thought. You know, does one game make it or break it for a guy when they've already played 10 or 11 games? Um, to me, no. I think, uh, you know, guys have already shown what they can do. Um, now, it, it can definitely help a guy if, if you're holding on to your ballot at the end and all of a sudden he just rises to the occasion and, and really puts a stamp on his season, especially when there's multiple guys kind of that have an opportunity, which I believe this year there, there are, you know, um, one of four or five guys could win it and nobody should complain at all, you know? So this weekend will be big. I think this year, some years it's kind of cut and dry. You feel like a little bit who's the top guy, but, uh, this year it's still, still up for grabs and, and there's a few guys playing still. Hey, Ty, what, what, it, why don't I see you in any of the commercials? Have I missed it? Why don't I see you in the Heisman house? I was in one uh, quite a few years ago, but uh, I, I guess I'm not a very good actor, so I, I never got asked back, but <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's, that's not one of my strong suits. I'll admit that for sure. <laughs> don't, you know, those things are pretty popular. Those things have kind of, I mean, sort of taken off, and, and they're really good. Hey, last thing. Uh, before I let you go, the game has changed. We mentioned it. I mean, you guys at BYU with Coach Edwards were throwing it before anybody was really throwing it. Big Ten was still, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust. I is that the biggest change, how much more people are throwing it, or what do you see? Yeah, I, I think the spread offense, the, the RPOs, the zone read for, for QBs, you know, growing up in Texas, it was a running back state back back when I was in high school in the mid-'80s. Uh, you know, the, the top running backs a lot of times came out of Texas. And then when the spread offense started and, and hit the high school ball there, the better athletes went to quarterback and and uh, coaches were able to do more with them. So um, that really kind of changed the game, giving, giving an athlete back there an opportunity to, to pull it, throw it, or run it and uh, and have the ball in his hand all the time. I it's that's why it's hard every year for somebody else to win the Heisman other than a quarterback because they're so Im involved in the game. I, you know, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Ty, I appreciate your time, man. Thanks for coming on. That's fun stuff. You bet. Thank, Thank you. you. Have, have a great day. That's Ty Detmer won the Heisman Trophy in 1990, and has a unique perspective. He's been all over, coaching high school, coaching the NFL, or excuse me, coaching college. And I'm telling you, man, back in the day, we I remember being in Hawaii going, whoa, what did Detmer do today? Uh, what's that? Let's go to break. We'll be right back. It's spooky season, and in 2023, for some, they're most afraid of getting canceled for a costume. So have snowflakes ruined Halloween and sucked all the fun out of it, or can we bury cancel culture for good? So my question is, is there a costume that maybe you wore in high school that you can't get away with now because of cancel culture? Like you'd be canceled because you wore it. I'm not afraid of being canceled. I can only cancel myself. So I'm here asking, is there anything that you dressed up in the past as that you'd get canceled for now? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Do you think cancel culture is kind of taking the fun out of Halloween a little bit? Yes, a little bit. A little People's bit. costumes are lame and boring now? Yeah, a little bit. Well, uh, for... For me personally, not as much, but I know that my mom uh, told me that back when she was in elementary school in the 70s, she dressed up as someone from like Japan or something and really overdid the facial expression or something. And so now uh, that wouldn't fly as much today, I guess, but, but yeah. Cancel culture meets Halloween. 
Has it ruined the fun? Are people's costumes just like too boring now? I think so. I, I, I agree with that. Everybody's too soft and sensitive about it. So I, I do think so to some degree, right? I think that like, it was a lot cooler when you dress up like a Native American, like people would get mad at you. I, I was actually a pimp when I was 16. <laughs> I was looking at a priest outfit and I was like, yeah, I don't know if I can really be a priest. Someone's going to complain. Yeah. Donald Trump costume. That's offensive? Yeah, you automatic fight. Automatically. Even if you're a Donald Trump supporter, like you look like Donald Trump, you might catch one. But I like Donald Trump. <laughs> Clay Travis, yay! So, what are some overrated costumes that you've been seeing this year? Oh, Taylor Swift, Kelsey, Thousand too percent. much. Yeah, way too much. Yeah, you're, you've done, you've overdone it. Come on. Yeah. What are you dressing as? Travis Kelsey. <laughs>Oh man, something's going on here. Look at that face. You can't hardly see it. Yeah, my live view dropped again, fellas. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know if we got to go to break. I don't know what the story is. But uh, my uh, live view went from about 5,000 to 20, uh, 250. That ain't good. That ain't good at all. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that sucks is that this thing decides that it's got a mind of its own. But it ain't bothering me, people. It ain't bothering me. The show must go on. Pat Fallon, rep, is going to join us, former Notre Dame player. We're going to talk about this NIL stuff. Coaches are complaining, and they're complaining a lot 
about what's going on with NIL and having to pay hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to quarterback. You know, it used to be the quarterback got the girl. Quarterback dated the cheerleader. Quarterback dated the hottie. You know, if Playboy... Last week in Las Vegas, a white high school student died after he was brutally beaten to death by a group of 15 teens, most of whom were black. And what was the reason, the excuse for this mob of thugs to pummel this boy to death? Well, 17-year-old Jonathan Lewis was reportedly targeted after he attempted to stand up for a smaller friend after that friend was robbed by the group before they threw him in the trash can. When Jonathan tried to get his friend's stolen item back, the mob turned on him and beat him into unconsciousness as he lay there curled up in a ball on the ground. The mob continued to punch and kick him even after he was out cold. Instead of helping Jonathan or calling the police, bystanders instead recorded the video and circulated it on social media. This has become the norm and standard practice, and that in and of itself is gut-wrenching. This is how young people behave in 2023. Content is king, and people, innocent people, are nothing but fodder for views, clicks, and entertainment. No morals, no conscience, no humanity. And of all the articles that have come out about the tragic and senseless bludgeoning of Jonathan Lewis, I haven't seen a single one mention race. I think we all know that if a group of predominantly white teens beat a black teen to death, cries of racism would reverberate from the New York Times to the Washington Post and back. The cries of racism would be deafening. But since it was a white boy attacked by a mob of mostly black kids, race is suddenly not an important part of the story. And the same thing goes for the Las Vegas teens who rammed a stolen vehicle into retired police chief Andreas Propes. Race left out of the coverage there again. Why? Convenient how that works, isn't it? I guess White Lives Matter doesn't raise billions in donations quite like the fraud scheme that was in his BLM Inc. But these attacks against white people are not unusual. They're not an anomaly. They just don't get coverage.
Hey, well, welcome back. What? We got some internet problems. It's a beautiful day outside. The sun is shining. And you know what? Apparently, my super boosted Xfinity didn't like what they saw. You know, we're going to, in a moment, we're going to talk to uh, Congressman Representative Pat Fallon, former Notre Dame player, played on Lou Holtz's team, sold t shirts while he was a student at Notre Dame, convicts versus Catholics, that kind of thing. But we're going to get into a number of things, one of which is going to be Notre Dame season, what he thought of it. I'll be shocked if he says, hey, Notre Dame sucked. Nine and three is unacceptable. That's what Ohio State guy says. Ohio State guy's lost his damn mind. Notre Dame guy, I don't know if I'm going to regret saying this, but is usually <clears throat> a lot more rational. I do I also... I can't believe this, and you guys know that I have family that is Jewish. My sister-in-law and my nieces and nephews, nephew, are Jewish, and I hate what's going on with the anti-Semitism, the pro-Palestine protests, and Hamas in a peace fire went ahead and killed some folks in Jerusalem just last night. But look, the deal is simple. I want to get his take on a variety of things. <coughs> Congressman Pat Fallon has been on with us in the past, and he's terrific. Look. We only have people that are terrific on this show, damn it. That's what we do. Hey, how are you, sir? Nice to have you on again. Coach, great to see you. How are you? I'm doing great, man. I am doing great. All right. You know, Mansion and Tuberville had a bill going, or maybe they still do, that's going to address this NIL. I saw yesterday Matt Rule of Nebraska said a good quarterback goes for one to 1.5 mil. Then I saw some other guys are making like five mil. Is this an issue that needs to be in front of Congress? Where do you see this as a former player? Well, Coach, I, honestly, I do. I love the fact for you know being a Liberty lover that somebody can uh, profit off their name, image, and likeness. I think that's a, a, a good step forward. Unfortunately, the way in which it's been applied, which is pretty much a Wild West you know, a no holds barred type approach where it's an inducement to say, hey, you come to this university and we'll give you X amount of dollars. That should actually be prohibited as far as the university talking to the student athlete uh, as to what they can make with the NIL. That should be something that that kid de determines on their own and it should be a true value, not something that induces a kid to sign with the university. Yeah, you know, I, what do you... What do you think will happen here? Will there be hearings in front of Congress? And, you know, how would you react? I always say this, you know, people can do two things at once, right? People always say, well, why is Con we got bigger things to deal with than Con Okay, shut up, people. I mean, they can do more than one thing at once, right? You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 what do you see ultimately? Let's go three to five years down the road. What do you ultimately see happening here with this? I, I would like to see something addressed where they, they, you find a good balance. And, you know, talking to some of the, the administration at Notre Dame, they wanted a fix as well. They, again, are all for you got somebody like, uh, dare I say, like a Caleb Williams, right? Uh, our nemesis from a, this is a Notre Dame guy talking about a USC Heisman Trophy winner. He won the Heisman Trophy. If uh, Imagine how much money Coach Johnny Manziel would have made if NIL was, was around 10-plus uh, years ago. So I'm all fine with that. But – Again, just not use it as an inducement to sign in a university because that's corrupting this, the very system that uh, you know we all hold dear. And there are still amateur athletes, but we don't want to you know keep money out of their pocket either. Yeah, I just can't imagine. I mean, could you imagine walking into Colts Holt, Coach Holtz's office and saying, <laughs> "Yo, you know what? Uh, here's my agent. I want more scratch. You know, you two guys figure it out, or else I'm out of here." Could you imagine doing that? Yeah, no, and I, 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 it's scared. I'm still, I think Coach Holtz is probably a buck 40 soaking wet, maybe, and we're all still scared of him. I, I was just with Tony Rice, <laughs> who was our quarterback, high trophy finalist, and Chris Ortz a couple years ago, who was the Outland Trophy winner, and Chris is still huge. And we all literally said we were going to greet him, and they, those two held back. And my wife said, what are you guys, scared of him? And they both looked at her and said, right. yes, hell yes. We're petrified. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I mean, I couldn't imagine going into Coach Knight's office. I'd have been like, hey, man, I just want my scholarship. I don't care. I just – just don't cut me. You know what I mean? <laughs> just don't cut me. Hey, um, college football playoffs are a big deal. You, obviously, as a former player, uh, Notre Dame is out. 
Like, oh, I was just saying, Ohio State people are completely irrational. The coach has lost three games total. They want him out. Notre Dame lost three games this year. Notre Dame people, I grew up right there. I grew up in Gary, have always been irrational. But I hate to say this, Notre Dame people feel very rational about this year's season and Coach Freeman. Well, you got to give the, the, the coach time to breathe. And, you know, Lou Holtz won the national championship in his third year. Um, yeah, in, in, in 1988 and we like Eric Parsegian, I believe he won his championship. I think it was in his third year as well. Um, I, so it takes a while usually to build the program up and coach Freeman. I listen, I've met him personally. I sat in his office with him. I think he's one of the nicest human beings on the planet. Now that's not going to get you very far if you have a four or five loss season in, in South Bend, but I do think he's a great recruiter. The recruiting classes are coming in. They cert they certainly had, somewhat of a uh you know they they were they fell short against ohio state and you have to kind of land that on his staff when you only have 10 players on the field and that kind of thing but they they had coached a great game up, up until that point so i really think that next year is going to be uh, the breakout year for the irish and i really hope i told him coach i said i want to see a statue of you outside of Notre Dame stadium and he said really i said yeah because that means you won a national championship baby <laughs> right right but I don't know, man. I don't know about this rent a quarterback. I tend to think about it as a player or a father of a player. And I'm like, look, you keep bringing guys in over my kid. And Hartman should never have shaved his beard. You don't screw around in the middle of the season. You don't do that. You keep the beard. What are you doing? No, you got to go with what's working, Dave. You know, I mean, you can't you right. don't change forces in midstream, coach. You just don't do it. And, but you're right. In fact, we were just talking about this last night. You know, Notre Dame brought in Sam Hartman for the one year. And now it looks like the Duke quarterback is going to transfer to Notre Dame as well. He's a, he's a talent. And I think he's going to be a great fit. But what, what happens to those kids that you're recruiting to play, you know, quarterback? And, the, you know, and they get to start two, three years. By that, that third year, they are excellent. And they know the system and they're leaders with the team. And when you allow this kind of, um, shifting around, I think you're really robbing um, a lot of players of that experience and um, that journey. I agree. Hey, uh, I mentioned this earlier. My, I'm Serbian, half Serbian, half Polish, 100% American. My brother married a Jewish lady. My sister-in-law is Jewish. My nieces, two of them, my nephew, Petey, they are Jewish, uh, raised Jewish. Uh, what's going on with anti-Semitism in this country is awful. What are your thoughts on pro-Palestine, actually sometimes pro-Hamas rallies going in and around the United States. Oh, Coach, thanks for bringing that up because it absolutely horrifies me. I mean, I would have never thought 20 and 30 years ago that we, I think we've advanced in, in race relations tremendously in this country, despite what a lot of people on the left, because they're, they say, because their currency is in divisiveness. Their currency is in uh, aggrievement and victimhood. And so one of the most successful ethnic groups we have in this country are Jewish Americans. I mean, a 4,000-year-old people, just a beautiful history and tradition, very rich. And to see the folks peddle in this kind of hate, it's very dangerous. We saw what happened in Central Europe 90 years ago when you started telling, saying that some people aren't truly fully human. That's how it begins. And then you take away their opportunities, and then you take away their property, and then you take away their liberty, and then you take away their life. It's a very slippery and dangerous slope, and I, we need to call it out for what it is. It's dangerous, and it's evil, and it won't be tolerated, and there should be, uh, you know, they, they should be called out. You can have some sympathies, if you'd like, but uh, for, say, the Palestinian cause, I don't think they're being rational when they say river to the sea. That's calling for the destruction of a state that has six million plus people in it. That is uh, very dangerous rhetoric. And also, these most of these pro-Hamas, uh, whatever, uh, Palestinian protesters don't have a clue. They don't squat about their history. It's just the latest cause du jour of the left. Uh, and that they uh, suddenly Palestinians are elevated above everyone else. And we don't want to see any innocent person be harmed. But the big difference, there's no moral equivalency between the IDF and Israel, the Israel state, and Hamas. Hamas intentionally targets and murders civ innocent civilians. And then when Israel reacts, they hide behind their own innocent civilians. They have headquarters underneath hospitals. 
They use mosques and schools as ammo dumps, and they'll shoot at an Israeli soldier and hide behind a child. And then if that child is harmed or worse killed, they try to blame Israel when it was their fault. There's not more evil people on the planet than these terrorists in Hamas, and we need to call it out for what it is. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at our college campuses. My stepdaughter went to Harvard, and now Harvard is like, I don't know, man. They're, they're, they're covering kids. They're wrapping them in blankets, Jewish kids. I mean, it's a scary deal out there for, for Jewish people. I, 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 you know, I, 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 do you feel like, has this always been simmering underneath the surface and this just brought it out, brought this prejudice, brought this anti-Semitism out? Is it, or is, is this strictly a response? I, I don't get it. I don't get where this is all coming from. To sit there and blame, let's say you got a 19-year-old a uh, Jewish kid uh, going to Harvard, and he's wearing a, a yarmulke. What does he have to do with what's happening uh, with Israel and Hamas? Like nothing whatsoever. And to, uh, to harass that individual in any manner is completely absurd and, again, dangerous. And what Harvard and these other uh, institutions of, quote, unquote, higher learning should be doing is having a code of conduct saying, if you do this, you're expelled. There's no tolerance, and we're going to refer this to, for criminal prosecution to law enforcement. If they said that, and then they actually backed it up, the Jewish students across the country would be much safer. But they try to coddle, and they try to, again, with the, play this moral equivalency game and say, well, we should tolerate, but you know, I can understand your anger. No, no, a strict code of conduct to protect all of your students. Yeah, schools brag about their code of conduct, or at least they used to brag about their code of conduct, and they use it whenever it's convenient. This is a, I don't know what more it could be. I mean, you can't, hey, did you see uh, the little boy that is under attack, nine-year-old kid, I think, that is under attack for wearing his team colors red and black and at the Chiefs game? Did you see any of this? Yes, and I mean, you're talking about, is it Deadspin that uh, quote-unquote broke the story? They got nothing better to do yeah. than harass a nine-year-old kid. They are called, I believe, the Kansas City Chiefs as a tribute to the wonderful Native Americans that were here for, I don't know, about 12,000 years or so prior to European and other folks' arrival. And to celebrate the Chiefs, and they got a pretty dang good team every year with Mahomes at the helm, and he, to pick out a nine-year-old kid who is innocently wearing some face paint, and I believe, get this coach, that he's ethnically – part Native American himself. Yes. So yes. how about you mind your own damn business and worry about something that matters? <laughs> I, I talked about earlier, you know, there are a lot of celebrities that are saying, I'm leaving if Trump wins. So I say this, I say, well, let's have a get the hell out of here bus. And if you're an idiot that's going to write about a nine-year-old kid, you're on the bus and you're not going to London or Paris we're sending you to Juarez, Mexico. We're sending you that way. You know what I mean? Like, if you're so ignorant and so in the division, get your ass out of here. It's non-negotiable. See you later. That's my get the hell out of here bus. <laughs> Coach, I think you just, you just wrote a piece of legislation for us. <laughs> right. You know, right. It, it, what it is, it's bullying. It's the left bullying. You pick, a, you know, a kid like they did with the Covington student that was standing there minding his own business had a Make America Great Ahead on, and he had some activists literally in his personal space, pounding a drum, trying to evoke a reaction, escalating and escalating. You know damn well and good that everybody has their own personal space where they can feel safe. And when you invade that space, something bad could happen. And that kid held his poise, and they, they ripped him and raked him over the coals. I think he's made quite a bit of money because everything they said about him was patently false. And... They were picking on an 18-year-old kid. That's what bullies do. They pick on people that they don't think can fight back. You know, that is interesting, you know, because bullying is such an issue in schools and all across our country that our media, our legacy media, our far-left crazy-ass media hasn't picked up on the fact that that's all this is. That's all this is is bullying. That's it. Nothing. I, you, you make a great point with the bullying. I didn't think about it from that standpoint, but that's absolutely right. Well, it's clickbait. What they're doing is they're just trying to get, they have this outrageous, if you, I, I look at CNN every morning because I want to know what the opposition is doing and saying. And uh, oftentimes the headline is contradicted by the article itself because the headline is right. they make money on clicks nowadays. It's a digital world. 
And they want you to, they want some outrageous headline that, well, most people that read CNN on a regular basis are left wingers. So it's something that will evoke a, a reaction and say, oh, I've got to read this. This is ridiculous. And they'll double click on it. Uh, like, for instance, George Santos is now represents every Republican in Congress when you and I both know he's an extreme outlier. They never let, uh, let's say, Rashida Taliban or what is it? Sorry, Tlaib, uh, have her be def have her define the entire Democratic Party. They treat her as the outlier she is. So I think it's a huge double standard. And if the legacy media coach didn't have d uh, double standards, they'd have no standards at all. That's so true. Hey, uh, side question. I, I've been involved in about 15 national stories, and I swear to God, never once have they gotten the story accurate. How about you? No. Like when you read something about yourself, how much do you go, hey, that did, no, that's not right. That's totally, what are you talking about? That happens all the time. And that's one of the things I was talking about with the Biden investigation. I think it's funny that the left, the legacy media and the Democrats are running cover for the Bidens. But if this, if everything that we're learning, and we could teach a three credit college course on the Biden family corruption, but if everything that we're learning wasn't true, then the Bidens could prove it. They could patently false. I'll give you a quick example, Coach, on myself. So there was an article that came out that accused me of making a 52% return on the stock market. And I'm like, hell, I did? That's awesome. It wasn't true. In fact, I didn't buy or sell any stock except one. It was Twitter when Elon Musk bought it. I had to sell it. I had no choice. It went from public to a private company. So the year before, I had done what's called a put on Twitter. It was $55 a share, but unfortunately it went down. So I had to buy Twitter when it was at $35 a share at $55. And then Elon Musk came and bought it for me for $54.20. So clearly, I lost money on that transaction as a, in totality. They reported that as a 52% return. Now, I went completely, you know, can we cuss on this, Coach? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, I went yeah. completely yeah. ape shit. I was like, this is ridiculous. I did not make any money. In fact, I haven't bought or sold a stock in two years anyway because I don't want to deal with this stuff anymore. I happen to have some wealth before I came to Congress. I just don't want to lose that wealth. I don't really care if it grows or not because that's kind of part and parcel to this business. So anyway, I got so mad about it. And some media outlets that were respected were going to run an article. I said, I will give you my portfolio. I would literally give you access to my stock portfolio. It has gone down $400,000 since I've been in Congress. I now will prove it to you. And they said, well, we need your, all your statements. I go, well, the only thing I'm going to redact, redact is my account number. And I did that. And then nobody wrote stories about it because it was untrue. I didn't have a 52% return. And there was, a, you know, the retractions were out there. But the Bidens don't do that because I think they're guilty as hell. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, look, it's easy to prove. You know, like Michigan, that guy Stallions, the, the sign stealer, could just go, hey, look, you know, he could speak to the committee and say this didn't happen. It's easy to prove if it's the truth. Like, it, right. you know, if somebody's saying something like you, you 52%, okay, here's the evidence, you're wrong. It's easy. It's, I always said this, I couldn't cheat on my wife uh, because it'd be too much damn work. I always thought it was too much damn work to, you know, to 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 be a criminal. Like, I maybe I'm lazy, but man, you know, hey, coach, it, I it's too much work. I couldn't take the stress. I wouldn't be able to take the stress of all that. I got enough stress and worry right? in my life. I don't want to manufacture right. and fabricate anymore. That's exactly right. But it is amazing to me. Like every article that I read about myself, I'm like, no, nah, that didn't happen. No, nah, that's See, not right. Nah, you know, and I know for you, it's it's the same. Hey, thanks for your time, Pat. I really appreciate you coming on. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure and blast. Thank you. Anytime, Coach. And thanks for letting me cuss. That was a first for me. On, uh, on an, yeah. An interview. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to go with, I didn't know whether you were going to go, I didn't know whether you were going to go with bat shit crazy or ape shit. I knew that was coming, though. I knew one of the two <laughs> was coming. I didn't know. Oh, that's funny. Oh, man, that, that's an awesome guy right there. Thank you, Pat. Hey, look, when Thanks, you play coach. for Lou Holtz, you're still scared of him. Lou's been on our show three times, and I'm sitting there going, man, don't screw this up because he's got a quick wit and he'll crush my soul. So we are big fans of, uh, of the representative, and we're big fans of Coach Holtz, man. That was a lot, a lot of fun. But the truth of the matter is, what are you doing, Deadspin? Like now... Julie DiCarlo, who is just the worst. She's coming at Bobby Barack. We got dead spin against Outkick. 
Uh, I'll tell you what right now. I'll take OutKick one, and I'll take that little Karan J. Phillips or whatever his sorry little ass is. Julie DiCarlo's coming at. He's coming at calling uh, Bobby Barack a sexist. Look, is that all you got? Like, is names all you got? Like, all you got to do is be a human being and say, look, yes, we were stupid. We attacked a nine-year-old boy. Harlan uh, uh, Holden Armenta didn't deserve that. You know what? We're going to try to do better. We've gone a little amok with our racial slant here. I get it. Deadspin's trying to stay viable. I get it. Deadspin's trying to stay in your public eye. It's like the indie star and Greg Doyle. He don't care about being right. He just cares about clicks. That's all these guys do. These guys have nothing to fall back on. I've said it forever. If that idiot right there had to talk about sports, that idiot would be broke. If there were no race, if there was no dead spin, there is not a company in America that would hire that guy. It's like the ex NFL player that, what do you do? Oh, man, I train athletes. Yeah, well, this idiot here, even his own co workers, Frank Isola and others, when he was with the New York Daily News, said, text me, said, Dan, don't even bother. This guy is such a lightweight, such a dumbass. And he is. And Julie DiCarlo, who I don't even know what she is. All I know is she's always mad at Alford because of something that happened with Paul Pierce or Pierre Pierce 100 years ago. And so she tells me I'm a, I enable race, ra- rapists and all kind of other stuff. She's full of shit. But anyway, they're coming at us, and we're ready. Boom! Oh, it would take me two seconds to knock that out. If we get in the ring, dead spin against outkick. <laughs> harumph, harumph, harumph. I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. Watch your ass. Yeah. Now I'm fired up. (laughs) I'm actually fired up. We're going to come at a nine-year-old little boy. And then you're going to blame it on the far-right media. No. I blame coming at a nine-year-old boy on the person that came at the nine-year-old boy. Don't that make sense? I don't know about you, but that's the Chiefs' colors. Maybe he should have put yellow right down his nose. I'm glad he put black, and I'm glad he put red, and I'm glad the Native American kid wore a headdress, and now I'm glad all these clowns at Deadspin are all jacked up. They're showing how insane they are, how evil they are, how awful they are, how full of crap they are. Yeah. You get them, Holden. You get them, Bubba the Daddy. You get them, Shannon the Mother. Don't take this crap from these idiots. You don't need to. We got your back, yo. All right, speaking of got your back, yo, I got some damn awards that I'm ready to give out. And I will never, I don't know if the sack man is listening, but I will never bet on my own again. Yesterday, I'm like, look, you Indiana fans, I want you to think about this. So Indiana has to go down to the wire to beat Army. Army hasn't won a game yet. So I'm looking yesterday, I'm doing some research. They're playing Central Connecticut State. It's the middle of the afternoon. I got a bunch of work to do, so I'm going to put the game on while I'm sitting right here. I got a bunch of stuff I got to get done. I got emails I got to send. We're giving away bikes. Lee set me up. Lee left uh, for the day, and I'm sitting here trying to get all this figured out. Then I got to go run an errand. So I put the game on. I'm like, ah, I'm going to bet it. I'm taking Army. Central Connecticut's got one win against a bad team. I'm taking Army. No problem. 28-point loss for Army at home. I'm never betting without the sack attack. The sack attack shall set me free. The sack attack had Missouri State last night, minus 10. That hit. I listened to the sack attack. I'm not listening to me. I'm going back to my old strategy. What's that? My old strategy of watching the game first and then betting as I'm watching. All right, I got some damn awards to get into. Hey, you guys on the YouTube chat, thanks for staying with us. Had a little technical difficulties. They seem to be cleared up. Also, who's going to be the next coach at Indiana? I got two words for you. Oh, be right back. What would you be willing to sacrifice for a Tennessee Vols championship? My wife. Your wife, Never okay. Never in a second. I'd, I'd let you take my whole left f-ing foot. My whole left. The whole left foot. The entire thing. Take it off. Can we go up to the knee? Like, as long as I can use, like, not just below the knee. Below the knee. A lot. A lot. It's been tough being a Tennessee fan since 98. 
I mean, I wouldn't give up like my firstborn or anything, but uh, close to it. I think your son said he was willing to uh, sacrifice his entire left foot. Well, he gave up his left foot. Well, I give up my right foot. We could that way hobble along. He'd have the left, I'd have the right. Well, first of all, where Tennessee beat Alabama 52 to 49 last year, I gave up a marriage for. What do you think the punishment should be for Michigan and Jim Harbaugh? Oh, God. They need a couple of years of uh, post like bowl game ban. Absolutely, without a question, if everything comes to fruition. And with if they're giving information to South Carolina about uh, Clemson and Tennessee from last year, I say you just disband the entire program. Death penalty? Get, get rid of them. Get rid of them. They don't deserve it. Ohio State should beat them for the next 30 years in that, every sport. I mean, that's even worse than not getting to compete in a national championship. Yeah, but cheaters don't deserve to compete for a national championship. Especially a guy like Harbaugh. Send him to the Bears so he can try and steal some signals there and see what happens to him then. I think they gave our signs to South Carolina last year. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's it, it, it's beyond that. It's beyond what they've even uncovered yet. They caused us to miss the Final Four last year by giving the signs. I mean, the I mean, like, he should be fired. That's the he should be fired. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We're getting ready to throw some hands around this hizzy. And these hands are bricks, baby. That's right. I've been lifting heavyweights. Yeah, I said it, heavyweights. Andrew told me my son's like, Dad, you got to get rid of that mush. I'm like, I know. So I've been lifting. He goes, I go, how do I do it? He goes, lift heavier weights. So I've been grinding, yo. Today, full body workout. There'll be some snatches. There'll be some thrusts. There'll be some squats. That's right. I'm ready to take on anybody that I need to take on. And one thing for sure about this face, it could take a punch. I'm telling you right now. I'm ready to whoop some ass. (laughs) Julie DiCarlo. You're supporting a rapist. Shut up. Steve Alford's my friend. You don't like what he did with a player that's on you. Shut the hell up. Uh, Let's see here. We're going to go into damn awards, and I got some emails from you guys. All right, stud of the week, Jalen Milrow. Let's make no mistake about it. Jalen Milrow is the anti-modern player. Why? Because Jalen Milrow, after a bad performance against Texas, got benched. Kid came over from Notre Dame, Tyler Buckner. He got a start. Now, Buckner was considered a big-time recruit coming out of high school. He started some games at Notre Dame. He's now at Alabama. He got a chance to start down in Florida. And what did Milrow do? Milrow acted like the stud that he is. He rooted on his teammate. He kept engaged. He did not sulk. I said did not sulk. Let me say it again. Did not sulk. Son of a biscuit maker. You kids did sulk. Look, there has never been one time in my life as an adult male with a penis that I have sulked. I may get pissed, I may get angry, I may get quiet, but I'm never sulking. I remember sulking as a kid. That didn't work out well for me. Jalen Milrow is a stud. Jalen Milrow then, of course, throws a 31-yard fourth and goal touchdown pass, and it was awesome. It really was to beat Auburn in the real big game. I understand Ohio State and Michigan. They got the big game. It's the most watched game. But I got to tell you, for drama, whoo. Auburn and Alabama, they take the cake, baby. So he is the stud of the week. Morons of the week. Inspire change, the NFL tells me. Really? Well, inspiring change is the money from inspiring change. They have a new outfit. They have new hats. They want economic equality. Yeah, okay. Social justice reform. Shut up. You know what? I'm just tired of all of it. How about everybody get along, get a job, and let's go to work and figure this thing out together as opposed to complaining and complaining and complaining. But the money is going to groups that want, among other things, no prisons. The money from the NFL is being funneled to organizations that want, among other things, no cops, no detention, no policing. They want a group to go into communities to solve our crime problems. Of course you do, because you're all criminals. How many Black Lives Matter folks would be in jail right now if they were white? Are you kidding me? 
The woods would be full of whitey in jail if they did what the Black Lives Matter leadership did, take public money and go buy mansions in Malibu. Yay, Rod, go fight win. Stop it, stupid. Criminals want, guess what? No policing. Criminals want, guess what? No jails. Criminals want, guess what? No prosecution. No different than a bald guy wanting hair. So anyway, NFL, stop it, stupid. Stop that crap. You're not fooling us. Inspire change. What change do you want exactly? Hey, Russell Wilson, you got like inspired change on your helmet. What needs a change for your million dollar married to a star's ass? Shut up. Man, oh man. Strangest story of the week. Mark Cuban selling the Mavericks yet retains full control over basketball operations. The devil is in the details here. I got to believe, I do, I'm sorry. I got to believe something else is going on here. I'm spending three and a half billion dollars. I said B, not mil, billion dollars. And I'm going to let the previous owner have control over basketball. Now, the valuation of the company was four and a half billion. So maybe Cuban, who does not have the majority share, maybe he negotiated in his keeping a bit a minority sharehold in the Mavericks. Maybe he negotiated this, but I got to tell you, if I'm paying $3.5 billion, man, I got to say to myself, hold on here. Something is fishy. If I'm going to let him, the owner. Now, look, I understand keeping the GM. I certainly understand keeping the coach. I understand keeping the contracts of the current players. But to allow the owner all basketball operations decisions? Let me explain something to you. When you buy a basketball team, the number one thing that you got to figure out is the basketball team. You win, they come. You win, you raise prices. You win uh, parking. You win concessions. You win jerseys. You win Everything goes good, so you better figure out the basketball. So I'm going to say to Mark Cuban, hey, you run it. Nah, something's fishy there. Something is afoot. Worst week, Jonathan Taylor. Look, Jonathan Taylor held out at the beginning of the year. He had an ankle. Jonathan Taylor now has a thumb. Jonathan Taylor is now out for as many as five weeks. I don't know that this is as big a deal as when we thought Jonathan Taylor missing the early part of the season with a holdout was going to be a problem. We thought... Um, until Zach Moss showed up. Zach Moss was averaging over 100 yards a carry in Jonathan Taylor's absence. The Colts are pretty good. The Colts have an esprit de corps that I really, really like. They do. They're a team that has energy. They're a team that seems to play together, and they're a team that seems to be winning because of that. Look, Gardner Minshew is a guy that will show you oft times in game that he is a backup and why he's a backup, but he also shows you that once in a while the dude can go ahead and make some plays. Pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I ain't mad at the Colts. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we ask for them. We get them. Emails are here. Now, understand, hey, let's show, I don't know if you guys have it, let's show how to get a hold of me, outkickdockage at gmail.com. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how to get a hold of me. If you want to leave a voicemail, 929-687-3940. Outkickdockage at gmail.com, 929-687-3941. Brian in Bloomington says, all I want for Christmas is John Gruden coaching in the Big Ten. There are deeper ties for Gruden than most people realize. Yeah, we talked about this. Not saying he's up for the job or interested. He's absolutely interested in the job. He wants the job. Make no mistake, when Rick Venturi texts me about it, Rick is one of his dear friends, he wants the job. Not saying he's up for the job or interested, but he is not a stranger to Bloomington. Please give me Gruden on the sideline against Iowa every year. Yeah, Gruden was a ball boy in the 70s when his dad coached at Indiana University. Gruden was a ball boy for the basketball team. Gruden was and still has a lot of friends in Bloomington, a lot of his childhood friends, including my ex-brother-in-law, Jeff Eamon, grew up with Gruden and was friends with Gruden and still stays in touch with Gruden. He's got connections there. Does that mean he should be the coach? No. But what it sh- what I think, he, why I think he should be the coach is because, well, Indiana has been awful, 3-24. and 24. You need someone that's a proven winner. You need someone that's going to give a spark. Now, the Big Ten has gotten more difficult. 
You've got USC, you've got UCLA, you've got Oregon, you've got Washington. Three of those four schools have the NIL all figured out. So they're going to come in, I believe, with guns blazing, at least as it relates to Indiana. Job got tougher. Need to put on your big boy pants. Need to talk to Coach Gruden. You don't take him, you don't take him. We shall see. Uh, Doug Brown, Dan Lebertar supports anything that he thinks is the angry black side of the argument because he wants to ingratiate himself with the black athlete. He describes himself as brown because he says his parents came from Cuba. To me, he looks and sounds like a typical fat white American. No offense to my fellow typical fat white Americans out there. If I had ever called into a show, I would have challenged him to take an ancestry DNA test to get the real scoop. See, I don't care whether he's from Cuba. I don't care who he identifies with. He is a typical fat white American. Never played never coached. If you took out division, if you took out race, he would have nothing. And he knows that. It's the same thing with the dead spin writer, Karan J. Phillips. If you took out race, he's got nothing. How could he? Now, in both of their little worlds, the far left crazy people like Julie DiCarlo for Phillips and Stugatz, the little knee pad wearing dude for Lebetard, oh man, they put him in a cocoon where they are right. Well, they're not right. Anytime you attack a nine-year-old boy for wearing face paint of his team and headdress that's sold in a costume shop and you continually do it and you mock him, you're an idiot. You're evil. And Levitar, Julie DiCarlo, Caron, J. Phillips, they're just simply evil and not worthy of our time. Dan, this is from Frederick Taylor, South Carolina. Dan, all the IU football players leaving shows how little connection they felt towards Indiana. How many leave would leave Michigan or Notre Dame? or Ohio State in a similar scenario. Most of them are there because they love the university. These players hold little affection for Indiana University. Freddie, I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong. I've seen, surprisingly, including a wide receiver named Tyree, leave Notre Dame. I've seen Ohio State players leave. Hell, Joe Burrow left Ohio State. You go where the money is in college athletics if, if you're good enough to make that money. Guys leaving Indiana, I don't blame them. Look, you have a good time at Indiana as a football player, probably too good a time, but you can have that anywhere. And if I'm not going to sit there and wait for a new coach to come in and, like Deion Sanders did, determine my future. If I truly love Indiana, I can go to the uh, transfer portal and I can come back, assuming that it works for both of us. But I don't have any problem with a kid saying, look, new coach is here, I'm getting the Sam hell out of here. I wouldn't go to a lesser school. See, the reason I went to Indiana University, even though a couple friends of mine said, well, you should go to Butler, you'll play more. Butler wasn't very good then. was like, I don't want to say that I could have played at Indiana. I don't want to say that I could have played in the Big Ten. I don't want to do that. I know life moves fast. I know four or five years in college goes fast. And I knew that I would have the rest of my life to live with the consequences of my decision. And I wanted those consequences to be, I took a swing at the highest level possible, overcame more physical ailments than you could ever know, and ended up being a captain at the best basketball school in the country and the best basketball state in the country. That's not the case in Indiana. Not the same thing with football. Just isn't. Uh, Fred Hevelin, one of my favorites, congratulations on your Hall of Fame news. Long overdue. I'm a friend of Kevin Custer. We work together at Crayola. Look forward to your ceremony in March. Best regards, Fred Hevelin, class of 75. Yeah, Indiana, the state of Indiana a couple days ago called me up and said, congratulations, you're being inducted to the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. Like, wow, no kidding. The Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame isn't the IU Hall of Fame. It isn't the Uh, Hall of Fame at my high school. It's the Indiana, the state of Indiana, and I'm deeply honored to be in it, and I'm deeply appreciative of my family and my friends. First thing I did was call my mother, my brother, and my sister. Second thing I did was call two guys, one named Mike Paulson and the other named Kevin Page. Mike Paulson and Kevin Page were senior guards, some of my best friends. We grew up together, and they wanted to win more than any two human beings I've been around. They passed me the ball. They were smart. They both said, look, we wanted to win, and you were going to get buckets. I'm waiting for my buddy Jimmy Bullock, 
who played at Purdue and was an all Big Ten player our senior year and a great player with me in high school to get in the Hall of Fame as well. But I'm deeply appreciative, and I wanted you to know on the YouTube chat that I very much appreciate your congratulations both on Facebook and Twitter and in the YouTube chat. Cashman says, here's a question. How many GMs has Tepper had since he took ownership of the Panthers? Problem is the person assembling the team. And even more so of a problem is the person hiring the people to assemble the team. Bad organizations are bad starting at the very top. Bears, Browns, Cardinals. Even the Colts in recent years, teams that are consistently inconsistent, that cannot stain any success, it's rarely a good thing, rarely a good thing when you are hearing about a team's owner. Like all businesses, it starts at the top and trickles down to the product and the consumer. Boy, you write about that. But I'll tell you something else. A good quarterback solves a lot of that. Jimmy Irsay was a terrible general manager, and he figured it out. He hired Bill Polian. That was a huge move. Bill Poley and Bill Tube and those guys got the Colts on the right path. Obviously, Peyton Manning took it into a next level type of deal. But I'll give her say credit. He was smart enough to hire a guy, Bill Polian, who had won, who had won big, who had started franchises in one. How Cashy is absolutely right. That's why I don't think that Bill Belichick is going to get hired as a general manager slash coach, no matter how much. He thinks he wants to be that. If I'm Tepper and there are rumors that Bill Belichick is going to come to Carolina, I'm not giving him both. I'm sorry. I'm just not doing it. I'd say, look, we're going to work together. This isn't a vacuum. I'm an owner that likes to be involved. Fine. But I'm going to hire the right general manager. I'm going to hire the right vice presidents. In fact, the way this should go if I'm Tepper is I hire two guys. If Belichick really wants out of New England, I hire him as a coach, and I hire Ryan Grigson as my general manager. I mean, all the guy did was win, and he won with a, quote, great generational quarterback, which is what supposedly Carolina has. But, Cashy, you could not be more right. You are 1,672% right. Teams with bad ownership seem to be, as you said, consistently inconsistent. Again, the Bears caught lightning in a bottle for a couple years when, after they decided we were going to bring football people in here, like Jim Finks and others, they decided we're going to draft well. Oh, shocker. They decided we're going to figure out the right pieces that fit. Willie Galt as a wide receiver, a sprinter. Walter Payton needs a fullback. Roland Harper for a while. Matt Suey next. Jim McMahon is going to be our guy. And we're smart enough to bring in backups like Steve Fuller to win games when McMahon went out. It's kind of simple, really. If you're an owner, hire the best, the smartest to run your football program. Hire the best, the smartest to coach your football team. Cashy, as always, you are a god. Uh, Bradley Cooper says he would rather watch the Eagles win than him win multiple Oscars. This is something I never understand. I, I don't get this. It's like, it's like Lou Holtz saying, you know, if you remember Coach Holtz on our show, when he was in the member guest at Augusta, and he won it, the member member, and he won it, said that was a highlight of his athletic career. Why? Because it was him. I'm not one of those guys that gets off on what others do unless I'm coaching them. Then I really get off on what others do. I do. But I like doing what I do. I like playing golf for money. I like beating my buddy Cam Safali out of some scratch on the golf course. Or Tom Fine. I don't know. It's fun to me. Why? Because I'm doing it. There are very few things you get to compete in. Like, I'm uber competitive about this show. I want to know the numbers. I want to pump up the numbers. I want this to be the best show on television every morning, and everybody and their mother looks forward to watching it. It's just what I want. That's me. It's my thing. Winning an Oscar is Bradley Cooper's thing. And I just don't understand. I don't. Look, the Eagles win. What's that got to do with you? I remember when the Cubs win. I was really happy about it. And then I woke up the next morning, I'm like, ah, I got to go to a meeting. Okay. Fine. Didn't have anything to do with me. If I had been on the Eagles the next morning, I'd have woken up in a drunken haze and puked and said, let's go. Let's go to the parade. 
I'm in. Let's do this. I don't get it. I honestly don't. I never have, and I never will. You know, Hugh Jackson, did you know this? Hugh Jackson was still coaching. I had a chance to meet Hugh Jackson. Pete Thamel, Urban Meyer, myself, were sitting during the combine, grabbing a bite to eat and a beer at St. Elmo's. My favorite place in Indy is St. Elmo's, not the restaurant, the bar. They got white tablecloth, little high-top tables of four at the bar. I love going there. I love sitting there, having a shrimp cocktail, getting a steak, drinking beer, having a great night. I just love it. I don't know why. I, maybe it's because in Indy, Lee and my first date, first place I took her was there. Got great memories. Long story short, we're sitting there, and Hugh Jackson and a variety of other guys came to the table because Urban's a big deal. Hugh Jackson came, and my initial thought was, man, that's a really nice dude. That's a really, really nice dude. I like Hugh Jackson. I did. So I followed him. Oh, man. I don't know if I believe anything he's saying as a coach. Hugh Jackson got fired the other day. Here's what he said about his time at Grambling. At the end of the day, people will only focus on wins and losses. But I know for a fact we were turning the program back into a monster that we all wanted it to be, but that takes time. You have to give it three years when you come in the first year. You don't want to walk in and run all the players at it. You need to make sure you understand the lay of the land. And I would have felt, though, it was warranted to be fired if this year looked like the first year. Yeah, he's right. Like, firing a guy after year two, there's a reason a job like Grambling was open. And it wasn't because the previous guy was so successful that, oh, I don't know, he had to go get a better job. No, the place was a shambles. And you got to give a guy three, I think, don't you? I could be wrong, but it feels like you got to give a guy at least three years unless there was something nefarious inside the program. Kids not going to class, undisciplined, you know, sex, money. I don't know. All I'm saying is this. All I'm saying is very, very simple. Give a guy three years. And Hugh Jackson is a nice guy. Uh, the Detroit Basketball Pistons. Listen to this. They've lost 14 in a row. Remember when Monty Williams was considered a great coach? I do too. When was he a great coach? When he had great players. 14 in a row. And Monty Williams, the coach of this mess, did something that is unprecedented in the world of college and professional basketball where players are such little batches that you can't say nothing to them. But Monty Williams did. Monty Williams said there wasn't a fight on the floor. That wasn't Pistons basketball by any stretch of the imagination. That's what this is. We have to have people that honor the organization and the jersey by competing at a high level every night. I'm not even talking about execution, just competing. That wasn't it, and that's on me. No, 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 no. Uh uh. No. Leave that last sentence out or half sentence, and that's on me. No, no. It's not on you, coach. It's not. You proved as a player you'd give effort. You proved as a coach you can coach. It's on the clowns. Look, Kate Cunningham is the poster child for entitlement. Probably a nice kid. He went to Colorado, Oklahoma State for a year. Oklahoma State hired his brother on the staff. He didn't want to play half the time, and then he becomes the first pick in the draft. Isn't a first pick in a draft supposed to elevate franchises? Isn't a guy that comes out and we got to listen to his complete nonsense of an 18 to 22-year-old talking and talking and talking? You know, we kind of told everybody, we did, I'm sorry, but we did. We kind of told everybody, beware of Jaden Ivey. Yes, the story was cute of Jaden Ivey's mommy. Yes, it was fun. Yes, Jaden Ivey's mommy is the coach at Notre Dame women's basketball. Yay, Ra, go fight, win. But Jay Ivey became a pain in the prick at Purdue. He just did. He looked disinterested as his stock rose. He would score points, throw the ball away, and Purdue still survived and won with him, almost in spite of him. Next thing you know, Jay Ivey's the piece. He's the Robin to Cade Cunningham's Batman. Maybe it'll play out, but right now you're talking about 14 straight losses 
and a coach that has to get on the player's ass. Mm. Get Isaiah, get Lambeer, get Mahorn, get Rodman, get Dumars, get Sally, get Edwards, get all these guys in there and beat the living crap out of these players. It's that simple. Let's give them a beating. <laughs> Bill Lane Beer, you guys want to lose 14 in a row? We're feisty today. Yeah, we are. Hey, it's time for Woke a Dope. Let's see what we got. Turns out gas prices are high because so much was wasted gaslighting the country for the last two years. Yeah, we were made to believe that boys are girls and girls are boys and boys can get pregnant and girls should play with boys and boys should be playing with girls. And oh my God, that's all normal. We were learned to believe that little kids, little kids can make a decision. Well, they can't make a decision about what to eat for lunch, but they can make a decision about getting their pee-pee cut off or about adding a pee-pee to a JJ. What is the world coming to? The world is insane. The United States is completely insane, but we're not buying it anymore. Freedom of speech is coming back. And if anybody that watched this show wants to get mad at me, God bless you. It's like I used to tell my ex-wife, you're mad? All right, I'll go over here. You go ahead and be mad over there. I don't want to hear about it. It's all good. The truth of the matter is, girls are girls. Girls have a JJ. You want to cut your hair and say you're a boy? I ain't buying it. You got a JJ? You're a girl. You got a PP? You're a boy. I don't want to hear about it. Eh, you do you, though. Whatever you want to do, I just don't want to hear about it. And why are girls transitioning to men competing against girls? And why are men transitioning to girls competing against girls? Somebody explain that to me, Spanky. Next! Yeah, that's exactly right. You see where the luggage and the old people, the hip people, are coming from. They drive their private planes or fly their private planes into these climate crisis meetings. And then they tell us, well, what I am flying to and what I am helping with in these conferences will save emissions, certainly more than my private plane. Look, this has been going on for years and years and years and years. There's still as many glaciers as they ever were. There is no such thing as climate change. There isn't. I'm sorry. This is a way for idiots to make money. If you disagree with me, good. Fine. I'm sure you can find data from the crazy left media. All I know is I look at what was said and I look at how it's played out. Always wrong. There will be no polar ice cap in the 90s. It's 2024, basically. Seems like there's a polar ice cap. Don't buy this crap. And when your spokesperson is a 13-year-old little girl named Greta, man, how stupid are you for even thinking it? Next! Uh Uh-oh. 2023 is the year Disney hasn't had a single $1 billion movie since 2014. Well, how do you expect it to? Seriously. Does everything need to be woke? Does everything need to be DEI? Does everything need to be, I don't know, anti-woman, anti-boy, anti-girl? I mean, what are you doing, Disney? How about you make fun things? Make a nice cartoon. Make a nice cartoon. Make it edgy, too. Make it like Roadrunner. Roadrunner was dropping anvils. Acme was blowing up stuff. Do yourself a favor. Get back to the basics. You know what? A coyote trying to kill the Roadrunner. Perfect. Make another one of those, and you'll probably have a movie that's worth its salt. Disney, you're starting to suck. I used to love Disney. I used to love taking my daughter and my son to Disney movies. I wouldn't go within a mile of Disney. I'm glad I don't work for Disney. Giving me gas. Anyway, I hope everybody has a wonderful day. But I got to say, dandockage.com. Dandockage.com is where you can go to donate to our bikes program. I am leaving right here. I'm going to Speedway High School. And I'm picking up, because Speedway High School people are awesome, I'm picking up 19 helmets and locks. And then I'm dropping them all off at a guy named Nathan's house. Nathan, on the first week of December, uh, probably second week, is going to deliver 19, oh, excuse me, between 70 and 90, we're not sure yet, bikes to kids for Christmas. That's 70 to 90 bikes to kids in need, and they're going to have a great Christmas. 
I really only remember two of my Christmas gifts of my long life. One was a Cuddly Dudley. That's right. I love Cuddly Dudley. I did. I had Cuddly Dudley slippers. I got a big Cuddly Dudley. I'm sensitive that way. I used to hug Cuddly Dudley, and I had his house. Yeah, you can call it a doll. I call him my dog. Don't at me about it. And the second thing was a blue Stingray bicycle. High handlebars. I never liked the high thing on the back. I always kept it low. I had the banana seat. That's right. I only remember those two gifts because I don't even know why I tell you the truth, but I'll tell you this, because of you all, because of guys like Sean Black, Otter Creek, and the rest that helped us at our golf outing, we are able to give 70 to 90. We are then going to give, at the end of the school year, another, hopefully, 100 bikes. And then at the start of the school year, and we're keeping this going. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, Speedway High School, I cannot thank you enough. Everybody that's donated, including some of my coworkers, I cannot thank you enough. Nick, Nick, thank you. Uh, Ryan, you're awesome. D uh, Dylan, you guys got this problem solved today, Ryan. Thank you for that. Uh, Aaron, you're the man. Beth the Booker, outstanding. Had a blast today. Katie and Haley, Davey, and everybody else, including Gary and Clay, thank you. We'll talk to you tomorrow.